Normally, when I present one of these editorials, I spend weeks, if not months, analysing and digesting the information at large so I can present it into something not only coherent-ish, but with fair intentions. I admit that some of my personal opinions do sometimes slip through the net, but I do at least try to remain as fair-minded as possible. However, on this occasion, I feel the need to just relax and speak my mind on a couple of things that have been building for a long time, but have kept coming and going before I've had a chance to present something relevant at the time of passing. That, and there's just been an unbelievable amount of stupid stuff coming up over the last few months that I just have to get off my chest. There's going to be some unpopular opinions, some of which without any form of practical solutions, but rest assured they're not being expressed with intent to harass anybody who disagrees. Just please don't do that. I'm happy to agree to disagree on things. So, not willing to make use of any kind of pun or double entendre for the title of this video, here's a number of thoughts that I shall simply call popcorn thoughts, because there's obviously not enough popcorn to go round in railway circles. Here goes. The decision to stop mining coal in the UK and import it from overseas is backwards. I get the whole need to reduce carbon emissions, and I'm not one who insists everyone should be driving around in gas-guzzling SUVs, but by shipping coal in from overseas, it's not only becoming more expensive, but it's making the level of emissions per tonne between 10 and 300 times worse. It's all very well saying that Kazakhstan coal might save heritage railways, just so everybody's got an excuse to say that god-awful Borat joke, but it may only really work for certain locos with big enough tubes and all the other mod cons that allow it to burn pretty much anything. By contrast, miniature locos have tiny tubes and small fireboxes that get clogged up with ash and clinker faster than Smokey Joe on rocket fuel. So overseas coal doesn't always work in their favour compared to what used to come from Fozzyfan. I just hope BioCoal works out. Vandalism has been ongoing for years, and the solution isn't a black and white instantaneous one, but there need to be tougher consequences for anyone who vandalises railway property, especially on volunteer-run heritage lines or model railways. I get they're an insurance nightmare, but when people are giving up years' worth of free weekends to work on a historic wagon, only for their efforts to go to waste when a bunch of in-betweener wannabes burn it down, insurance money alone doesn't make up for it. I'm not saying the angry kids of this world need to be shot or anything like that, because please don't stick to their level, but simply charging £500 compensation for 30 grand's worth of damage isn't likely to make the vandals realise just how much they've messed up. Tor Valley being briefly repainted into purple is fine. I know a lot of people are really hacked off with the Seven Valley Railway over this, but it's just a one-off occurrence to celebrate 70 years of the Queen being on the throne. She'll go back into more authentic colours. I can understand people getting upset if it was something like City of Truro or the Sterling Single, or maybe even Flying Scotsman going into something completely inauthentic, but come on, there's 31 engines with the exact same pedigree in preservation. It's not like we're not aiming for more than 95% authenticity and less than 5% spitballing fun. Cancel your membership all you like, but that's not going to stop anything. And speaking of multiple locos... Much as I'm sorry to see Dumbleton Hall depart for Japan, I'm okay with it because we've still got more than a dozen halls left, and that one in particular has just sat around doing nothing for more than 20 years. Yes, she's the oldest hall in preservation, but she's not worth crying over like she's being broken up for scrap. Is this how people reacted when Pendennis Castle moved to Australia? If it was, then I'm glad I wasn't around to see how that turned out. I'm not exactly the biggest fan of Francis Bourgeois, but I don't get the monumental levels of hate towards him either. I mean, personally speaking, I despise TikTok, and I think the whole GoPro headcam shtick that he does was done better by Chris Barry back in 1989, but he just seems to be doing what he enjoys doing, and it's not like he's marginalising or demonising anyone in the process. I can understand those who think that it's not the greatest representation of the hobby as a whole, but then neither is a group of disgruntled jealous people directing targeted harassment to someone on the internet. Doesn't mean you have to like him, you're more than welcome not to if you don't, like I say, I'm not his biggest fan, but simply targeting someone just because they put themselves in the public eye through the internet is pretty much like saying John Lennon was practically walking around with a big red cross on his head. But while we're on the subject of appreciation of people who get more shit than they really deserve, Shout out to Jago Hazard, Laurie Rose and Anthony Dawson, amongst other people who do what they do despite the negativity thrown their way. The internet in general, and social media in particular, has allowed school playground levels of hate to go unchecked towards people who do what they do for the sake of entertaining and informing the masses. Again, not saying anyone has to like them, some people will just not get along for the sake of not getting along, and not everyone with a mutual interest is going to be your friend. But I'm thankful for each and every person who produces similar content and doesn't turn it into some kind of slagging match. And if Lindsay Ellis has taught me anything, it's that things on the internet escalate the wrong way far too easily. I have absolutely no sympathy whatsoever for anybody who knowingly buys a house next to a working railway line and then complains about it to the railway. 
I mean, take for example the bunch of houses that recently sprung up at Woodthorpe next to the Great Central Railway. For years, there was at least one resident there who had been alleged to cause fights with enthusiasts, try to plant fast-growing trees without planning permission just to block the view, and apparently delay trains by throwing stuff on the line. I mean, I get why you may have a gripe with some of the line-side enthusiasts if said enthusiasts leave litter or trespass on your property, but the railway themselves can't be blamed for who they can't control. More importantly, said railway has been there since 1899. It can't invade your space if you didn't own the space first. So the railway makes the occasional noise every 30 minutes or so on busy days. It's not 24-7. It's not like they're going to stop altogether so you can spend an extra 5 minutes in bed or watch match of the day in your pants with the curtains open. Just learn to live with it or move away from it. Railway modelling is rapidly becoming too expensive overall. I mean, I can understand why it's becoming more expensive in general. Everything is becoming more expensive in general, sadly. But then given how the cheapest non-Thomas steam locomotive on Buckman Europe's website is nearly £130, and the cheapest mains-powered Hornby train set is £80, you can't help but feel for the average family household who need to spend that sort of money every week just on food. Or for singles and couples who may have to spend that sort of money every week just to live. I'll be the first to congratulate manufacturers for creating some truly stunning looking models in recent years, and I get that research, development, startup costs, tooling, quality control, etc. does stack up, and I get that some models may not sell in very big numbers, so their retail price needs to be high enough in order to justify making them in the first place. But when the price of existing ones keeps going up, but the quality and detailing on them remains the same for decades, it almost seems like a bit of a mick take to those who are interested, but are neither in the youngest or oldest demographics. I mean, speaking for myself, I've known families neglect Hornby's model railway range in favour of Scale Electric because of the value for money. And speaking of railway modelling... Hornby could have avoided the whole embarrassing saga with Rapido over Lion and the Titfield Thunderbolt set if they'd have just dropped it the moment they found out a rival firm had already obtained the worldwide rights to produce one, or just trolled them back. You know what I would have done if I were Hornby in that scenario? I'd have dropped making Lion and made a patentee. But in order to express any displeasure I might have, I'd have also taken one of Hornby's existing models, say, maybe one of the rebranded Thomas shells they've recycled, yeah, stay with me on this one, painted it in similar but not identical colours, and then sold it, not as an inspired by Titfield set, but as something like the Breast Hill Lightning Clap. That way, you don't have to pay a fortune on startup costs for new tooling or research and development. It's not technically infringing on any existing copyright law, seeing as it's parodying the original Titfield property at best, which technically can be covered under fair use or fair dealing guidelines, and seeing as it's just rehashing an existing model, it can be priced lower as something for parents to give to their kids as a starting point into the hobby. YouTube needs to stop randomly demonetizing creators, seriously. It's 2022, the whole debacle with CoasterFan2105 should not have happened like it did to Simon Poole. People rely on YouTube to make their money these days, so YouTube randomly decided to take away creators' monetization without letting them have their say on the matter first is f I mean, if any other employer randomly stopped your pay without telling you why or giving you a chance to have your say, they would be breaching their contract of employment and you would have legal grounds to approach an employment tribunal. People moan at me for selling my back catalogue on DVD and digital download instead of keeping it for free on YouTube, but given everything that's happened and how little YouTube pays by comparison to physical media, it's a safer means of allowing me to continue. And before anybody tells me, filming trains is a hobby and nobody should be expected to pay for it, yeah, tell that to Telerail, Transport Video Publishing and Video125, or even the BBC on some occasions. And anyone who says filming for YouTube isn't a real job, I can tell you from experience that the taxman kind of disagrees. And that's about it for now. Time to resume normal service before I really do become the next Jonathan Pye. I'm Chris and I'm here to gauge the issue. Down.